you know, do you know what fireflies look like? Do you know what a field full of fireflies looks like? I mean, yes, but only because I went through a phase in my life where I did a lot of camping in different places, and I once saw that, and it was amazing. My children don't, because I can't find one for them. So here we are back again with Shane. Um, and did you want to go into the children of men thing that you were just discussing? Because that's just a bit about the, the dystopias that we see out there and, and how, you know, maybe it'll be cancer from everything and we won't be able to reproduce. Maybe well, it'll be overpopulation. We don't know. You know, we've got, we, we've, we've, I think, um, we've entered into a phase where I think what we're doing on the planet is, is, is a fairly natural thing in that, um, it's an idea that I was introduced to in, I think, OAC, OAC biology. That was back okay. when they still, when they wasn't grade 13, but they still had something. Yeah, my dad did that. Okay, back in the day, eh? Um, <laughs> and the idea, it's, it's not, you know, um, universally accepted or, or embraced, and it's, it's a little bit of a simplistic model, given later scholarship. But what, what I was introduced to was this idea that... Um, a lot of biological populations have an inclination to make their environment less hospitable to their own survival and more hospitable for another species, a successor species. And you can, huh. you can look at this if you think about the, um, the evolution of the environment of a, of a, of a rocky surface, for yeah. instance. Like, you know, the, the glaciers swept the rocks clean and what came back was lichens and from lichens beget mosses, and then you get you get the beginnings of breaking down the rock and opportunities for new species yeah. to come in Gradually and outcompete the... the lichens and the mosses. But of course, if you go north Ontario, you've got lots of lichens and mosses. But in some places, what you've got is is far more growth um, that isn't hospitable to them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the so the only reason the lichens and mosses are still there is because the cold is stopping the grasses from coming in. And the only reason that grasslands are still grasslands is typically because of wildfires, mm. because otherwise it would just become conducive for trees, be gradually become an old growth forest, and the grasses would be gone. That's so. Yeah. 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 I mean, the mature forest is is kind of seen as the the um, the the end of the spectrum in a sense, but it's it's not. It's right. It's part of the fluctuation because they're susceptible to other things like fires, like diseases. And, yeah. Um, so this idea that this idea being that sorry the the. Um, the idea that was in my, my, my OAC biology textbook was that um, humans are gradually polluting the earth and making it less and less hospitable for themselves and more, and more hospitable for a, a successor species. And the one that they had targeted at the time, that they named as probably being most likely to survive the conditions that we were creating was the cockroach. <laughs> okay. So that was, I, it was, it was something that stuck. Um, this is okay. So I'm gonna make a sci-fi movie when I have a budget, which will be maybe never. But if we, if Zach, Lily, Savon, if we get a budget, so it's 2230. The Earth is populated by giant anthropomorphic cockroaches, and they find a last settlement of humans oh. who have been surviving against the odds in this bubble. And they come, they're like, what are these alien creatures? These must be the ancient ones from whom we have our cult, only they talk like bugs. These must be the ancient ones from whom we have found relics. Okay. So that's just, yeah, let's make that show. Anyway. Um, Athens, yeah. Um. Yeah, yeah, you know. I mean, yeah, ancient ones. Anyway. The, the um... So the movie thing. The movie thing, yes. If you yes. like. Um, I, I, I'd like to come back to it because part of what, the, the premise of the children of men, and I, I, I've talked about this at length a few minutes ago, I just, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. I'd like to point out that cinematograph, cinema, cinematographically, it's, it's a really impressive um, bit of movie making. There's mm. some very extended complex scenes and great action. Um, yeah. And a lot of, uh, almost a naturalism to it that, that, that's rare enough. Um, and it's in this setting that itself is very, I think, believable. It's set in 2035 in the UK, um, 19 years after the last child was born on the planet. Wow. Um, so, so 
the premise of it is that sterility comes in and humans aren't able to reproduce. Yeah. Um, because of the various cocktails that we've created for ourselves. Perhaps. It's actually not given in the movie what happened to cause this. It's, yeah. it's you know, kind of unique. But it was just, there's, a, there's an interview with a nurse. Not an interview, but a, a scene with a nurse who describes how her and her colleagues just suddenly realized that fewer babies were being born and 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 then started collecting data and, and everybody was experiencing the same thing. And the babies just stopped being born. And it's catastrophic and cataclysmic and, and what it does to society is it kind of seems to break down the purpose of it or, or even the, the, the very existence of love becomes such a rare thing. It's hidden in the woods. And, you know, there, there are isolated pockets, if you like, but by and large, society doesn't have love, doesn't have a relationship with uh, among humans. I mean, there's, there's lots of media and flashing lights and yeah. messaging, right? Like, like this crap that we live within right now, which is just advertising and memes and scrolling feed of feeds, you know, like, what yeah. am I doing eating this, you know? Um, mm. The, there, there are some very heartwarming parts of the movie. It, it's not it's it, it's got elements I'm gonna say of of hope, but it's it's also got this really well thought out examination of what happens when society just doesn't give a shit anymore. And hmm. a lot of the discussions I've been reading um, in and around Jem Bendel, the near term human extinction crowd. I mean, there's there's you know Facebook groups and interesting. Yeah. How many people are thinking about this? Like. I think I can mention I can mention the group, the Near Term Human Extinction Support Group. Yeah. Just reached six thousand members. Wow. And it's a very active group of people who are discovering the the, the state of the environment um, and how dire the future pers- perspectives is. Yeah. And they're coming, trying to come to terms with it together on on a platform. Yeah. Um, but just sharing their grief, their worries, their their. Their, their sadness you know how do you how do you enjoy your children when you fear that that you've brought them into something that's going to be utterly cataclysmic and I mean this mm. isn't the first time you know there's there was the, the 1980s was a difficult time yeah I grew up being afraid of nuclear war yeah as did my parents and, and others right um, but you know people were born into the, the, the plagues in Europe. People were born in the Irish famine. Not so many, but, you know, they were. And lots yeah. of people died. And that's, yeah, that happens in periods. And so, when the question of extinction comes up, and I, I'm not sure if that was something we did on air or not, um, but but the, this idea that pockets of humans yeah. might survive. And I said, no, I don't think it's going to be the rich guys because they're going to get taken out by their guards for their dinner um maybe maybe how do i know who knows um but i think that would be a a a, a weird environment that would be very dependent on systems that i don't think they can rely on Hmm. you know they're going to be dependent on electricity and alarm systems and you know um yeah a community that maybe isn't all that reliable um you know Firearm supplies, okay. Yeah. So, so the marauding hordes are coming to your door again and again and again and again. And in ten years, you don't have any bullets left. So now, what do you do? Because the bullet manufacturers are long gone. Yeah, yeah. It's very uh, Mad Max Fury Road. Uh, there's there, there's there's a view of that, of course, and there's a lot of eco village kind of views as well, right? That say, you know, we can separate and and maybe look at living a lot closer to the land and smaller communities. Yeah. Going back to something that actually works on a human scale, like you know, whether it's uh, some people talk about 150 people being a, a, a manageable, natural community that, that human minds are actually capable of dealing with. You know, you can know 150 people it's fair, well, yeah. right? But you can't know 500,000 people. I, it's challenging. I, I rarely, you know, the, the, this has started to change after 10 years in Kitchener that I see people I recognize. Yeah. I, I do all the time. But I see a lot of people I might recognize, but I, I've probably seen them 50 times, but they're still completely strangers to me. Yeah. And, and I think that's what living in an urban environment is like. 
I think, yeah, I think that's why uh, community groups are so important, because they're little pockets, you know? Of course, yeah. And I wanted, I wanted to talk about that a little, because you brought up, in our, in our, uh, in our break, you brought up this, um, this habitat refuge for bugs that you guys are doing in your neighborhood. Oh, yeah. And I, I think this is, you know, this is something where, you know, on a broad scale, yes, we need to call out governments to be more accountable, and I mean, even if you didn't believe in climate change, the earth is, is changing and, and things aren't great. And, and, and you know, th there, there are things that need to be done that aren't being done. So mm. on a broad scale, yeah, we need to, to have our governments be more accountable and perhaps we can, we can mobilize socially. But on a smaller scale, you can also bring more nature into your life. You can have trellises and vines and rooftop gardens. Tell me a bit about that. Tell me about this community group and, and how you guys have organized to create this uh, what a butterfly track. It's a pollinator pathway. Is pollinator what it is. pathway. So, so starting with that, um, the pollinator pathway idea, and, uh, and I'm learning about this. Um, we're bringing yeah. in a, a consultant who, who works with pollinators and designs pollinator gardens. But there's this, uh, this um, realization, I suppose, that a pollinator garden is only as good as getting there. As, as the pollinators can get to it. Right. So, um, you know, given industrial agriculture and the poisons that we, we, we do put on the fields and the loss of hedgerows and, and, you know, I mean, people farm almost right up to the river kind of thing. Yeah. Um, there's not that many places for pollinators to exist and thrive. Mm -hmm. and, but, but cities can actually be something of a haven for a lot of wildlife. Um, Squirrels, a, because, raccoons. Because we don't use as much in terms of direct um, intentional poisoning because there's lots of neat little nooks and crannies and hideaways and because there is a, a bit of diversity hmm. like like a, a, a monocultured cornfield you can look at it right now yeah and what is it it's a desert there's, there's nothing going on there mm -hmm. barely anything left in the soil and there's no there's no vegetation Right? You look at your yard, I mean, it's got, it's got all kinds of things. You've got, you know, spruce and ground ivies and little things shooting up here and there and lots of places where a rabbit could probably hang out and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and be safe from foxes and hawks. And, but there's hawks here too because they know there's rabbits here, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. cities are actually like, you know, they, they, there is some viability to them. And what we're trying to do is improve the, the habitat for pollinators by... Um, encouraging pollinator gardens in a kind of a chain. So in our neighborhood, Central Frederick, we're, we're just, um, we're, we're having a meeting um, just in, a, in about two, three weeks um, to yeah. introduce a bunch of our neighbors to this idea. And I've already got, you know, a bunch of people who've gone, yeah, I'm in, I'm in, yeah, come yeah, yeah. in. Because um, we, we have a pretty good neighborhood um, discourse going on, a dialogue, like we talk to each other. And it's it, it's a nice important. thing about, you know, neighborhoods that, you know, is very different from let's say the city or what have you, but, um, and it's part of the city, of course. Yeah. So I think, I think neighborhood barbecues where people get to know each other are just generally a great idea. You know, that little sense of community makes you feel safer in your own home because your home is now in a community of people you know and not strangers. Yeah. And, and it brings you back to that kind of natural kind of population that works hmm. on a human scale. Sure, rather 150, than, well, yeah. Well, rather than, you know, something that needs to be institutionalized and, and um, numericized mm. and, and, and separated, right? Like, I mean, you know, the bus system. What do you know about the bus system, the people who run it? The, the, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a tool. It's a device yeah. you might use, but it's not something that's really sort of integral to your life in interesting in a personal personalized kind yeah. of way I mean, I, you know you can get to know your bus driver if you take the same route for 10 years you can have a, you can have a good friend there yeah yeah i find if i i commuted with the bus for a little while yeah and uh i would i would get on the bus and there were those three people who i would always sit beside on that commute mm -hmm. and gradually we started talking and eventually you know eventually eventually after a lot of time spent looking at our phones or reading books we eventually began to connect and then suddenly it was something to look forward to because it was like, oh, I wonder what Jerry's up to. Well, I'll find out as soon as I step on this bus. Yeah. yeah but yeah. yeah, but definitely like. Well, we, I think we really seek that though. Like, I mean, that, that kind of humanization. I mean, the, the lonely, loneliest place in the world is an elevator. 
Like, it's, it's just hideous. Have you ever, you know, just, I, I went through a period in my life where I just insisted I was going to strike up a conversation with, or at least say something. Yeah. In every elevator ride. Yeah, it worked a couple of times, but it was very uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, the, the breaching, the silence was very uncomfortable, but a lot of people were very uncomfortable with it. You know, there's, there's other yeah. people who have done experiments. You know, they walk into an elevator and they stand facing everybody. Try yeah. That out. You know, why does everybody face the door? Because they want to get the hell out of there, right? But you're close to people, and they're yeah. strangers, and it's just the weirdest thing, I think, psychologically. It's, why it's are we so afraid of strangers? strangers? I, I think it goes back to a long, a long, long way. I mean, Nietzsche, Nietzsche uh, talks about how our instincts were created in, you know, over a million years of, of, of not even being able to, you know, before we had language. Mm. Our instincts taught us things, and we relied on them, and they're still very much a part of us. And our instincts, if that's 150 people, is all you ever see in your whole life, except for people who are going to kill you because they want your women or your, or your food or what have you. Yeah, then, back in those ancient days. Then you don't really like strangers that much. You know, I mean, even in, the, in medieval times, like the guy, the, the, the wandering people weren't, they weren't to be trusted. You know, it was a tough life to be, you know, if you could play music, you could buy, but... Even even then, you were you were kind of sure. spit on by society. Okay, the depression, right? Yeah. Just walking Drifters. town to town looking for a job, and it's like, no, we got nothing for you. Keep going. Yeah, we've got our own community to take care of. Yeah, that that. that so in all kinds of scales, I think that happens, you know. Um, but I think, why do we why do we abhor strangers? I, I don't think you know. Yeah. Because it's difficult. It's not a natural relationship. One thing that I am seeing more and more of. Oh wow! Oh, look right above us. Uh, one thing I'm I'm definitely hearing more of in these interviews is I'm getting a sense that you know humans humans alone often feel powerless to deal with their emotions, be it sadness about loss of biodiversity or other things, and that when we connect with each other on a personal level or when we work together on a common goal, that is, when, that is when things happen. That is when life improves. That is when, you know, solidarity is found. That is when you make friends and life has meaning again. Mm -hmm. So I really, you know, things like community groups, things like finding people who, who share your environmental views or, or your political views, um, I mean, I think you have to be careful not to get entrenched in a bubble of people you agree with but I, I do think that you know community is just is very underrated and and it's so important you know like I know that this is, we're, we're gonna launch into me just for a second here but uh, I was you know my, my friends are often are often surprised because for a while I was living in a house with my parents my sister my child uh, his mother for a while was living us with it as well and my grandmother, and it was like a three-generation, seven-person Eastern European household. Everyone's just yelling at each other in Romanian. You know, my poor baby mama didn't know what was happening. But <laughs> you know, and and like I, you know, my I am able to do this stuff right now because I live in my parents' basement. And a lot of my friends are like, "Oh, but like you're 30, aren't you going to strike out on your own and be alone and independent?" Well, why? Why would I lose this wonderful, supportive community that exists in this house where I live? And I think something somewhere along our cultural line, there was this idea of striking out on your own and making your own way and being, it's all about you and it's all out for yourself. And I think that just leads to isolated people who are lonely and easily manipulated by, by societal rules. I don't know. Like, I think the more, the more community we find, the more positive things happen and, and, and the more we find that you can rely on people and that it works. Mm. I don't know. But yeah, so, so on, a, on an environmental side, to go back to sort of our, our theme here, um, it does sound like, you know, the fact that you have some connections with your local community is going to help you guys create a safe pollinator space for some insect habitat connectivity. I think that's very cool. Yeah, well, you know, again, just, just the form of that, it's about using 
a number of those isolated individual resources, which of course every family is a community unto itself, but it's then it's connecting those into a common project. Yeah. And it's really kind of neat because, I mean, communities happen at, at, at those different levels as well. I mean, I hope we keep it on a kind of a human scale. Yeah. Um, but there's talk of, you know, seeing it replicate 10 times in Kitchener as well, right? Yeah. So, so it's, it's neat because ideas do that. They spread and they build communities. I mean, communities can form around ideas. There's, there's yeah. all kinds of them that, I mean, maybe they always do. Um, hmm. Ideas, geographies. Yeah. There's different things. I really like the idea of you guys having a map. Because if I saw a map and I was like, okay, I'm here. These guys are here. If I plant some wildflowers, okay, do I have any friends that live here? Like, and that's very much part of the exercise of our, our first meeting is to, is to make this map and show where it's viable and where we might have holes mm -hmm. and say, okay, well, we need to find somebody there. And somebody at this yeah. meeting, presumably, will be able to point to a neighbor who's probably easily swayed enough to, or, you know, maybe already mm -hmm. has a start on a pollinator garden and just needs a bit of encouragement and help. Yeah, um, And awesome. I'd really love to see it. Like, you know, there's, there's, it's so rewarding to see, you know, like a swallowtail butterfly in the city. Yeah. Two in my 10 years here. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, we've got a rabbit who comes regularly now. I mean, lives, she lives five houses down. <laughs> but he comes and visits our yard and picks up the sunflower seeds that the squirrels don't finish off. And, it's, you know, I, I mean, I, yeah. I really enjoy seeing that. It, it, makes, it makes me m much happier, I guess, with the environment. And it comes back to this idea that cities can be kind of havens for, for biodiversity if we're, if we're yeah. decent with them and generous with them, right? Like, I mean, people don't like rodents, but rodents eat ticks. And people don't like ticks, but they don't necessarily know that. So, I mean, part of it yeah. is education, right? And it's like, and, and, and it's getting those conversations going and, and, and getting together in communities. I mean, what's the root, what's the root of community, do you know? Well, it, it, commune? Commune. It's together, right? Same as communication. Yeah. Right? So, so communities and communication are, are like, you know, integral to each other. So we've talked a lot uh, this evening about sort of overarching environmental issues that might be quite challenging for humanity to, uh, to survive or to at least to continue our current way of life. Uh, would we say that the solution may lie in the forming of communities and, and taking on of light projects? Can I just rip that to shreds? Would yes. be okay? Yeah, okay. All right, the idea that we have a, f a, a, a form of life or what... Our, our lifestyle? Yeah, yeah. Well, my lifestyle has nothing almost in common with a yak herder in Mongolia, except we probably both have cell phones at this point. <laughs> okay, solid point. But sure. my thinking is that, you know, when, when the system fails to provide electricity and fuel and food, the yak herder's probably got a much better chance of getting through and having children and sustaining a life because it's, 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 I'm going to say, less removed, let's say, from something that has proven itself um, consistent. I, I, mm. I, I hesitate to use the term sustainable, but it's, it's managed over long periods and hasn't changed a great deal. I mean, I think there's a lot of forest people in the world who could live similarly. Um, yeah. Were it not, and were it not for, well, A, encroachments by human beings, but also the loss of biodiversity, which a lot of them rely on for for sustenance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so there's, you know, in, in a sense, okay, coming back to the Extinction Rebellion, the, the symbol, and, and I have a sample here, I wouldn't mind maybe just pulling it out. Yeah, yeah, I go could. ahead, go ahead. As, uh, if I won't throw or, things off here. Um, there's a really interesting idea with this. Um, yeah. Now well, we pull out a flag. Inside that circle, which is our, our earth, let's say, yeah. is an hourglass. An hourglass. Time. I'm just talking about the time that we've got. And I look at, you know, the yak herders or the um, remaining tribes in the Amazon, and, and you can see the time is shrinking out. Like this, this, this hourglass, it's, it's almost inverted in the loss of forest in the Amazon, mm. right? It's like that's the sand disappearing. And yeah. when it's gone, it's gone. There are the trees, like grains of sand being sucked away. Well, it's not trees, it's football field size, you know, every day. Every day. Yeah. It's going on. And, I mean, the, the poisons and crap. Bolsonaro, apparently, the, the leader in Brazil, has approved 150 new pesticides in his first 100 days. 
I don't even know how like a leader can. Ha- I, I don't. I don't know how anybody can lead like that. And yeah, I mean, he's uh, he's obviously. Who does he care about? Just the, the agricultural money? lobby. Yeah, clearly that's what's running the show. But I mean, how? I don't even know how they do it. How do they? How do they actually imagine that this is good for them? How do they sleep at night? I, I think they sleep at night. I mean, I, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. <laughs> but, Probably. But, but Otherwise, are they, are they they'd all be not, really tired. I, I mean, mean I, I don't get it. I don't know if they're not cognizant of the impact of the policies that they're insisting on, of their own actions, yeah. or if they only value, I mean, if they're, if they're simply valuing their own material well-being, and I'm going to count that in dollars, over the health of the environment that they rely on, but they, they rely on it. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to, so first of all, this is great. <laughs> we'll put a link. Extinction Rebellion. Oh, yes. Let's not go extinct. There, there's a Canada, an Ontario, and a KW if you want. Nice. All right. Okay, yeah, we'll throw some so, links. XR is everywhere. I, I want to I wanna throw something out here, which is, you know, we talked a bit about children of men and this, this psychological concept they play with that if we can't reproduce, what is the point of life? Where, where does love go? Where, like, why are we here if not to reproduce? And I think it, with that, you know, what that makes me think of it is, you know, the sort of the seven generation thing of, of the, 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 the indigenous tribes, many of them, in Canada that they hold to, that you're, you're not taking care of things for you, you're taking care of things for seven generations down the line. And if we're only thinking about ourselves and our own materialistic gain, what is the point of life? What is the point, of, according to children of men, that's not, that's not enough to have a meaningful life if mm. you're not taking care of it for people seven generations down the line. Or for your children's children, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, and I, if you I, don't have children, then for your brother's children, or your second cousin's niece's children. I think we find meaning. We, I think we, we we'll, we'll create it, even where it doesn't belong or exist. Maybe like I, I feel like we've 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 really deluded ourselves in in thinking that the things that we've come to think are important are. Are, are somehow are, are, that they are important. I mean, I, I sorry, <coughs> completely tripping over my words here. No, I feel you. I, feel I I went through a phase where the most important thing in my life for a well, not the most, but a very important thing in my life for a brief period of time was growing my Instagram following. Mm. Well, I, I mean, you know, I do want you guys to follow me on Instagram. Obviously, <laughs> if you're watching this, actor Michael, but. <laughs> But, you know, he, I, it, there were justifications for it, you know, but it, it wasn't spiritually fulfilling. No, sure. You know, and, and, I, and it, it took me a while to wake up and go, man, I'm putting a lot of time into this getting an Instagram following thing. And then I search for self, I search for meaning from how many followers I have. And it's really hollow and empty. And then I uh, kind of cry myself to sleep after like what am I doing here you know I think I think we all we all do things like that you mm-hmm. know I mean and and through phases I mean you you say that as if it were a past thing and I'm I'm hopeful that you find other things to do that is more meaningful or that you're at least less obsessed with your followers there. <laughs> but you know I mean that's that's a very um common temptation I think that a lot of people fall prey to and I mean it's a temptation it's it's yeah. almost like you know the, the the kind of thing like as a as somebody who was raised Catholic I would I would associate with the idea of, of sin, perhaps. You know, yeah. there's a, there's a, maybe it's a pride or something. Um, Prideful, some, yeah, vain, definitely, yeah. yeah. Um, that, that. Oh my goodness! Seven brief aside. Seven deadly sins, 2019. Pride is just like an Instagram thing. Yeah. Hey, just continue. Sorry. That'd be fun. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Go for it, man. Okay. Um, sorry. Continue. Right, so, so I, I think, you know, what the idea of sin points out things that are, you know, ultimately character flaws in a social setting, right? They're, they're things that make it difficult for people to live with each other. Hmm. Um, I, that's my reading anyway. Okay, And, yeah. and I think that we're, we're embedded and imbued with them. Um, and I, I think 
it's been wonderful for me to discover, to, to recover um, the therapeutic impact of time in nature. The other evening, I spent a full 10 minutes watching a beaver lazily strolling around, floating on his back in his pond. Not, not on his back, but um, it was like he was just, you know, strolling about the pond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and my dogs were there and they're just, you know, barking at him and um, wondering if Beaver. they should go swimming with him or if they should run away in fear. And, but it was just, you know, a, a blissful kind of setting. And yeah, yeah. Um, I know it's, it's, a, it's a selfish thing at this point, but I feel I need it just to, just to rejuvenate myself. And, and I do it daily if I can, yeah. Um, yeah. to just recover in a sense from, you know, the work at the computer and the noise from the neighborhood and the buses and the fire trucks that go by, you know, yeah. it's, I think there's so much, I mean, you hear about, well, maybe you haven't, but um, forest bathing apparently is a thing in Japan. Oh yeah. Right? And um, doctors in Scotland, I think now are prescribing time in nature for mm -hmm. medical um, conditions. hundred percent. And yeah. I, I mean, yeah, yeah. Where do we lose that realization? We, well, I don't think we, 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 we've never been so far removed from the earth, from a relationship to dirt and living creatures. And yeah. I, I think we've lost a huge amount in losing that relationship. And I mean, gardening is nice, but it our, is. our lives are, are, you know, while we've, we've, I said earlier that we've got very good at, re, at, at isolating ourselves from the causes of our death. Um, but I think death is very much a natural thing and yeah. nature is going to cause our death. And if we keep pushing it off and pushing it off and pushing it off, I mean, it's like, it's like there's a, there's a wave coming in at the door and we can hold it for so long. Yeah. But like a dike breaking, it's, you know, it's quick when it comes. And I, I don't know if that's, that's not something I fear. That's something I expect, but I don't fear it. And, and, mm. Uh, this might this might be something I want to express if I can. Um, I, I don't think the demise of humankind is a catastrophe. I, I I think it'll be something of a relief for certain natural systems, um, but I fear that we've actually put things in place of fear. I, I regret that we've put things in place that are going to have to roll themselves out. Um, and I think... Um, I think, to, to, to put it succinctly, I feel like we probably culturally greatly overvalue um, the quantity of human life. We, we, we seek duration more than quality. We mm. seek numbers more than meaning and sustainability and community even. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's natural. Of course, we reproduce like any animal would. Um, you know, like, like, but are we smarter than yeast? I don't know. Are we just going to, you know, multiply until we can no longer live in the pile of shit that we've created for ourselves? I, I think so. I think that's what we've done. And, and fossil fuels were a real good boost to that, right? Yeah. They have done so much to give us so much power. Power, man. You look at those diggers digging holes in the ground, like, all over the place. I tell my kids, this, look at those, man. They will be talking about those in 500 years. As well. This is the time of giants. There's never going to be something like that again. Well, some of them are huge. They're monsters. Yeah. These they are, are modern monsters. They are monsters, man. And they rip holes in the ground and they tear the earth apart. Yeah. And we guide them and we make them. And that's what that's what we do. We, what do we call it? You know? Progress. Bleh. Building? Yeah. No. Fuck. Fuck, man. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Having a moment there, but I hope you'll forgive me. For no, that was that. beautiful. Thank you, Shane, for sharing that moment with us. I definitely, yeah, you know, I mean, we're animals. We are, we're highly intelligent. We've built social systems. We have technology, but we are animals. We come from nature. We live off of nature, you know. Food still comes from nature. The proteins inside of us still come from nature. The air we breathe still comes from We are still nature. Mm. And in our, our tech-filled cities, we're so far removed for, from that. I mean, I, I definitely also feel that when I spend time in nature, I feel way better afterwards. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, yeah, I mean, if we kill nature, we kill ourselves. We are animals. There we you. are part of nature. Can I come back to the, the um, 
I mean, this is this is getting I think fairly fairly philosophical and perhaps even a little like um, long-haired for <laughs> some of our conservative audience tonight. Um, uh, well, it's okay. But they're, they're here to understand us, just like yeah, yeah. They come uh, on here for us to understand them as well. Yeah. Well, I I mean I I I'd like to come back to it, but I do appreciate that, and I hope to converse more um, and listen more sure. and listen better. And I I. Thank I, you for I can't that. speak for them. I can only speak for me. But um, and I lost my thought, unfortunately. But we were on just nature, modern monsters, the giant machines. Thank you. I wanted to introduce an author. I read a book um, by his name's Charles Eisenstein, mm -hmm. and the name of the book will come to me. Um, the premise of the book is about um, carbon as an accounting system being part of our problem. Our problem is the perception and the problem I guess with the global warming um, arguments and, and even the movement that's behind it, the political movement and activity, the calls for renewable energy and EVs and what have you. He says this is about an accounting system where you're counting carbon molecules. He says, that's not even our biggest problem environmentally. He says, look at, look at water cycles. Look what we've done to forests and what that does to rains and, and, and the flow of water and the regeneration of aquifers. Yeah. You know, he says, look what we've done to biodiversity and, and, you know, in those forests, but also, you know, in the food systems. And, you know, there used to be a thousand types of rice grown. There's now 11 commercially on the planet, right? Like, yeah. like it's, it, and, and that leaves us very vulnerable um but rather than than committing ourselves and and investing everything we have in this accounting system he says like well, we've got to really improve our relationship and like revise and review our relationship to the living earth that we are a part of and and you know we're we're part of its life forces and we've perhaps abused our our position um and, and, but we've also lost it. We've lost a recognition of where we belong and where we are in nature and like, you know, that, that we are subservient, entirely subservient to its forces and possibly to its whims. And we don't like to put a character on it. You know, I mean, religious people have, they have a character. Gaia worshiping perhaps has a, has a character, but you know, what if there is a certain sentience in in the earth that we, we we could read if we try you know we can look at ourselves as as a pest that the earth is trying to fend off by heating up you know how do we deal with a, with a with an infection we warm our bodies up because it enables us to fight it better and we try to kill it to save ourselves now if i was the planet i'd have done that long ago with this nasty species that has abused it so badly and not really long ago you know, it takes, takes a long time for a planet to think of things and to, to recognize a problem. Wow. It's pretty, wack, pretty wacky. I don't usually think of the planet as like a, um, a willful being. Yeah. But certainly comprehensible in that way. I mean, I would, I would even say kind of justified. Like, like, yeah. What if climate change isn't killing nature? It's nature killing us because it's really annoying <laughs> what we've been doing. Wow. Wow, yeah. Woof. Woof. Indeed. Yeah, these are some thoughts. And the planet's not dying, it's just got a fever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah to get rid yeah. of an infection. No, I don't know. A human can I, infection. Can I, can I come back to something? Yeah. Um, I, I, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, oh, shame. Of course. You ended our first half, if you like, with a, with a discussion um, around hope. And I think hope is a really interesting idea um, and, and concept to, to, that we have to deal with all the time. I mean, it's hope and, and despair and grief um, and, and even enthusiasm for actions, right? The other day I read a, a, an article, um, it was a photojournalist um, essay, and it was quite brief, called Photographing the Last Two Remaining, sorry, let's yeah, repeat that, that. Photo Photograph Photographing the Last Two Remaining northern white rhinos on earth. 
they're females. It's a mother and a daughter. The, own, the, the last male died last year. Um, and they're giant hulking beasts. These like like 2,000 kilogram kind of things, you know? Yeah. And the, the, these rangers are like laying on them having a nap. They love them. They're family. Yeah. They're the last two. And it's, it's just heartbreaking to, to, to think, you know, such this, this great noble beast. And what have we done? We collectively, yes, we can, we can berate the Chinese for, for you know, in, endowing its horn with such powers that, that it's somehow worth wiping out the species for a belief. But don't we do it all the time, right? Yeah. How many frogs have we killed draining swamps for parking lots? A lot of frogs. Yeah, yeah. Many <laughs> we certainly have, but I mean, it's like we don't give a thought to them, and I, I, I mean, it's, I, I'm, I'm really struggling. I, I still am a carnivore on occasion, um, certainly an omnivore, and I, I really struggle with it just about every time, um, and partly it's the the disgusting awareness of the disgusting nature of factory farming which provides so much food um, and I try and avoid that those sources but yeah. um, it also strikes me that as I as I'm more attuned to the loss of life on this planet that the, and, and the, the deaths of these creatures impact me more and more I'm like well what what right have we to kill anything I, I, I mean, you know, is, there, is that that moral question? And it's not one that, that I've ever really visited in any depth. But I think it's a profoundly moral question. Hmm. And, and, and I think it, 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 it almost undoes morality, in a sense, you know? I mean, Nietzsche's beyond good and evil kind of thing. Like, the lion can't help it. It's a lion. Yeah. If it's got a sheep, it's going to kill it and eat it. Because we're little natural beings. And, and okay. Maybe, maybe that was the moral moment that I had. But I don't feel right about killing things, especially when they're scarce and beautiful and precious. And, you know, like, like, sorry, the rhinos again. But um, I don't know how to deal with that. I think it's really difficult. And I think it's really difficult to imagine that we can, we can um, sustain or let alone improve the, the well-being and the, the life of seven and a half billion people without continuing to kill the planet. And I think that's our dilemma. I, I don't know that we, I don't think we can stop ourselves, frankly. I don't. We've got a will to live and reproduce. And we're smart, but we're not smart enough to stop doing what we do. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I, I, I would maintain that the technology exists to be able to have both if we wasted less and allocated resources carefully and like I, I mean I'm, I've always been an optimist but <laughs> I'd like to think that we have enough resources that if we were more careful and if we were more mindful and if we distributed things a certain way we, we could continue to you know, maybe not to continue progress quite the same way we have, but we could continue to have good lives and still not destroy the planet more. But I don't know. That's just that's just me as an optimist. I might be wrong. I think there's there's a lot of pockets um, where where we've engaged in those you know restorations. Um, but everyone did it though. If everyone was became one of those pockets, don't you think that could tip the scale? I have a hard time imagining it. I mean, I, I, yes, if everyone, but that's that's such a yeah, that's a, a enormous that's a order. <laughs> it's a rather big if, and and it's one that I, I don't think the evidence supports. Um, and and I mean, this is. You know, partly this is a reflection on our current politics and, you know, coming back to the source or to, to the beginning in a sense is like you, you see people like Bolsonaro and, and the 
Trumps and, and you know, the Canadian right wing anti-environmentalist agenda. I mean, you know, I, I work in renewable energy. Why don't I like Doug Ford? Well, <laughs> um, it, it's not, it, I don't like him because I don't think he's a competent leader, frankly. Um, but I, I he's, a, he's a politician and he was able to get people to vote for him. And part of that was that a lot of Ontarians don't give a damn about renewable energy. They don't see a need for it. And that was a big bone of contention, especially in rural Ontario. I mean, I get it. You put up 500 windmills in like, you know, a county, it's just, it's, it's gross. It is, it really changes the landscape. And I wouldn't want to live in the middle of a wind farm. I wouldn't. Sure, yeah, yeah. But it doesn't mean that wind energy is a bad thing or that solar energy is a bad thing or that we don't need to flip and get off the fossil fuel thing. And I mean, you know, to, 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 to make those exclusive is, is just, I feel like this is what happens with politics, right? Yeah. Right. Sure. And, and, and I mean, I've long been a, a proponent of proportional representation. If we could just, you know, get a little more even keel. Yeah. Maybe we get a little closer to this idea that we could all sort of get pockets. But I mean, I'm, again, I'm, I'm looking like, okay, it was only a 38% electorate that brought in Mr. Ford. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 38%. Which points to the flaw in our, our, structure of our electoral system but um that's still an enormous population that that feels the way they do and i'm not i'm not saying that they're in agreement with all of his policies i hope the hell they're not um and the, the last straw for me was this this threat to the endangered species act i mean given the the state of species speciation today and the the the, the risks to wildlife like like how, how can you pull away a protection like that so that developers don't have to like count the dead bonobos under their windmills that's crazy because i gotta do that that's what i do eh? like yeah, that's one yeah. of my one of my jobs is, and, I, and i've never actually found a dead bonobo um not a bonobo not a of, sorry a bobo <laughs> sorry. No, goodness i'm sorry a bonobo is a um large monkey, yeah. large monkey it's one of the one of the top fours no i was thinking of bobo link um Bobolink Link is an endangered um, bird species, oh, uh, a okay. threatened bird species okay. in, in Ontario, and uh, and so you know, my I, I work with a renewable energy company that has a windmill project, and um, we monitor to see if birds and bats are being killed by our windmill. Yeah, and nice. windmill owners need to do that. I mean, there's no more windmills going up in Ontario probably for a while, so that's not the big deal. But you know, birds and um, birds are killed far more by buildings than they are by windmills. Yeah. The, the, the studies show, um, you know, the statistics are, and buildings are one of the biggest biggest killers, that and house cats, right? So, um, but I, I mean, what I'm getting with the endangered species thing is that we, we could just um, basically pay for the right to not have to protect the species that may be relying on this bit of the environment that we want to turn into you got a you got a little finch there, I'd say. This is definitely a problem with with you know the legislation around endangered species exists so that we are a little more careful with our parking lot swamp draining mm. to not kill species that there aren't a lot of. So I don't know. I I think it's definitely pretty irresponsible of his environment mis minister to uh, to take that away. Um, Shane, listen, we, we uh, should probably get this wrapping up, but thank you very much. You've been, you've been so candid, you've been so, so personal, and, and we just really, really appreciate your passion and appreciate you coming to talk to us. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Well, I really like what you're doing here, and I, I, I really hope to hear more of the conversation, because and, and, I think I've got a lot to learn about. Uh, may I? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I continually find myself... When I see things like this, I, I just, I don't understand the thinking behind the people who make decisions like that. And what it sounds like you're trying to do is, is help people like me understand people like them and help people like them understand people like me so that we can actually recognize, hopefully, um, that we are people, like people. Yeah. And, and maybe we can use that knowledge to make better decisions collectively. Ah, that, that's the that's idea, hopeful, okay. man. That's You are an optimist, you said. So. <laughs> very true. Well, <laughs> Shane, you've definitely helped our cause today. Thank Thanks you a lot. very much for all of your time. Really? And
and uh, yeah, we'll post some links in the descriptions. Uh, yeah, as always, you know, please like, follow, Instagram, Facebook, podcasts. Will do. Uh, <laughs> those things. Yeah, Patreon, if we have it out by then, probably. Uh, yeah, all right. Well, thank you, guys. Yeah. Thanks a lot.